Welcome to our presentation. Um, we're Group 22 and we're going to be covering the company Theta. Um, yeah, so my name is Ignacio. Um, I'm going to be covering cash flows and financial ratio. Um, I would like to, in the future, I would like to go into a career that is established within IT and business. Yeah. To begin with, we're looking at cash flow from operations. When looking at the cash flow from operations graph, we can see a somewhat consistent pattern between the years 2015 and 2016 but shift in the year 2017. When we look at the net cash flow graph, uh, we show we see a shift within the net income. So these factors do impact the net cash flow of operations, which are used to, op which are used to show how a company operates. Um, moving on to investing and financing. Evident within the investing graph, we see an initial 50 loss within the year 2015. Normally a loss with regards to investing shows poor performance and judgment within a company although sometimes it just shows initial investment. Often losses can deter investors from investing in the company. In this case, due to lack of other investment losses within, within other years, it becomes evident that the initial investment was placed to set up future plans. Cash flow could have been the result of purchasing property or investing in other companies. To conclude, the investing side of cash flows, uh, we also see no cash inflows, meaning that the company, Theta, hasn't sold anything such as property, or investments of other companies. Continuing on, we look at financing cash flows. So looking at some of the actual data that makes up the cash, uh, financing cash flows, we can see that during the year 2017, the company actually paid at least, the least out of any year in dividends, yet surpassed previous years in terms of notes payable and contributed capital. Due to the huge shift in amounts paid for notes payable and contributed capital, we see how, net cash, how the net cash flow from financing alone contributes to the overall net cash flow flow for the year being negative 60. Evident within the graphs, uh, we see the difference in values between years 2015, 16, and 17. Okay, yeah, that was that one, yeah. Uh, overall net cash flows and beginning cash amounts. Uh, so yeah, so now I'm gonna be looking at the net, overall net cash flow and the beginning and ending cash amounts. Uh, so with regards to overall net cash flow, consisting of all three uh, net cash flows, we see the increase in overall net cash flow between the years 2015 and 2016, resulting in the beginning and ending cash values to also increase. Unfortunately, this trend changes within the year 2017, which we can see a value of negative 60 within the overall net cash flow, resulting in ending cash for the year being a value of 10. So what does this mean for the company in 2018? Well, this means that company beta would have a beginning cash flow amount of 10 within the year 2018. Uh, this would definitely result in consequences for future aspects in terms of the company growth and their financial si situation. Essentially, this means that we have to tweak some of their operating, investing, or financing costs to begin to improve their ending cash flow uh, to generate more cash in the future. Sorry. So now I'm going to go into the first financial ratio, liquidity. Uh, so liquidity ratios determine the debtor's ability to pay off their current debt obligations whilst not raising the external capital. Essentially, liquidity ratios are a measure to show the margin of safety within a company and the components involved within it. Uh, saying this, com uh, companies tend to want higher liquidity ratios as it displays better coverage of, out of outstanding debt and shows companies' ability to liquefy. First, first is uh, the current ratio, which measures a company's ability to pay off its current liabilities, uh, essentially meaning the short-term obligations. Due to this, this ratio allows investors and analysts to determine a company how a company can maximize its current assets in the balance sheet. Uh, so evident within the graph, uh, we can see an increase in the current ratio as an overall, uh, meaning that the company's liquidity position is improving and has massively improved from the years 2016 to 2017. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So sounds right. now we're gonna move on to quick ratios. Similar to current ratios, quick, uh, quick ratio is an indicator of a company's short-term liquidity. Uh, this ratio type can also be called acid test ratio due to showing a company's ability to use assets instantly. Similar to current ratio, we can see the same trend or slope, meaning that the overall liquidity of the area of the company is improving. Uh, lastly, we move on to cash ratio, which shows whether a company is at risk of financial difficulty in terms of their ability to pay off short-term debt with cash in hand. Uh, in terms of cash ratio, the risk factor is determined whether the ratio is above or below one. Uh, since the ratio is not equal to one, but below it, the company does not have the exact same amount of current liabilities as it does cash equivalents. Uh, yet we see a slight decline in the linear representation of the cash ratio. 
Uh, seeing this, it becomes evident from the graph that throughout all the years of the company's cash ratio, there hasn't been enough cash on hand to pay off all the short-term debt, uh, suggesting that the company is at risk of fi having financial difficulty. Although this could be, this could also be a result of a longer than normal term credit. So my name is Eden, and I'd like to work in an IT and business incorporated position eventually, and I will be analysing the remaining ratios for beta. So continuing on to profitability ratios, we decided to primarily focus on the returns, as it shows the most information about the company's situation in terms of efficiency. Through analysing the return percentages, it becomes evident that they peak and reach their highest during the year 2016, but they massively drop during the year 2017. So looking at the graph, something similar occurs throughout the year 2014 and 16. Although the change in return isn't as big, and, and through this we can assume that it isn't really a display of poor performance. We're looking at profitability ratios, the return, the higher the better, so seeing drops in return is very concerning for investors and current stakeholders of the business. So when looking at the return on assets and return on equity, again we see an initial increase for the year 2016, but then a massive decrease in the year 2017. So looking specifically at return on assets, we can see how effective a company is at deploying assets to generate sales and achieve profit. So seeing this drop is not good for any party involved in the company. So moving on, RSEE or return on capital employed is a very important profitability ratio as it displays how companies generate profit from their capital, essentially looking at their long-term financing. Noticeably within the graph, again, we can see huge drops from 2016 to 2017. Consequently, this means investors might be turned off from investing when screening the company due to the drop. Not only within the return on capital employed, but in other areas as well as return on assets and return on equity. So moving on to financial leverages. So financial leverages or solvency ratios measure the extent to which a company, in this case beta, can cover long-term payments and sustain operations with their equity, assets and additional earnings. A debt ratio of zero means the company is fully equity financed. A moderate debt ratio allows the company to benefit from interest tax yields, resulting in a higher firm value. However, a high ratio lowers the company's value as the debt is higher. Between 2014-2017, the debt ratio re reduces, indicating beta's firm value is increasing. Equity ratio further reinforces this, as a 100% ratio means it is completely equity financed. A moderate ratio means the company benefits from interest tax yields, and a low ratio shows a decreased firm value. The long-term debt ratio indicates the long-term financial risk, with a lower ratio resulting in a lower risk and a higher risk, higher ratio resulting in a higher risk. All three ratios show that beta has remained consistent, though with an increase in firm value and a moderate financial risk. Next, moving on to asset turnover. Yep, so asset turnover, also known as efficiency ratios, analyze how well a company uses its assets and liabilities internally according to Investopedia. As shown in the graph, the day sales and inventory remained steady through 2014 and 16 and declined in 2017, concluding that beta's inventory turnover has reduced. The day sales and receivables significantly increased in 2016 and declined again in 2017. This is a negative as it indicates that beta's receivables were collected at a higher frequency in 2016. The day sales and payables follow the same pattern. However, the increased number of days in which payables were paid correlate positively, but the decrease in 2017 correlates to a negative decrease. The cash conversion cycle shows the number of days in which beta's cash is in inventories and receivables, meaning a shorter cycle is better. The graph indicates that the number of days in the cycle has doubled since 2014, negatively affecting the company. Comes to market value measures. So market value measures essentially allow investors to decide whether a company is worth investing into by showing their growth rate. A company's dividend payout ratio shows whether or not growth is present, present in the company. The increase in beta's dividend payout between 2014 and 2016 indicates steady growth and expansion. However, the decrease between 2016 and 17 shows the company maturing and becoming steady. So the dividend yield follows the same pattern as well as investors earn less per dividend as beta's growth declines. The retention ratio is what a company holds or retains from profits put into further growth. The decreasing ratio from 2014-16 <coughs> to 
share that growth is not a priority or has already been sufficiently funded. However, the increase in retention ratio in 2017, along with the decrease in growth as shown previously indicates that more growth is expected in 2018 onwards. Lastly, the sustainable growth rate shows the maximum growth rate using only internal financial resources. Therefore, the higher the better. Unfortunately for beta, the sustainable growth rate has steadily declined between 2014 and 2017. So my name is Nathan and I'm going to be talking about the time value of money and my career aspiration is to work in the US design. So for the first one about future value, we have the question, Samuel invested $30,000 at 9% effective annual interest rate for six years. Calculate the future value of his investment. Um, so for this one, we have the future value has a positive relationship with the other values. So if the present value is increased, so will the future value. Also, if the interest per period or the number of periods will increase, this will increase the future value. And for the present value, we have the question, David would like to have a savings of $14,000 in an account at the end of five years. Calculate the amount he needs to save now if the savings account earns an annual effective rate return of 4%. So we have the equation up there. And so the present value has a negative relationship in this one, unlike the future value one that had a positive. So if the values of interest or the number of periods is increased, this will have a negative effect towards the present value, so it'll decrease it. So for calculating I, um, Edward invested $12,000 in a fund offering a rate of return of 4% per year. Approximately how many years will it take for the investment to reach $15,000? Uh, so this one again, in this, for calculating the interest rate, it has a negative relationship. So therefore, if the future value is increased, this will have a negative impact on I, as well as if the present value or the time, so N, is increased, this will have a negative impact on I. Um, yeah, so I will be smaller if those are increased. And for the last one, about time, so Edward invested $12,000 in a fund offering a rate of return of 4% per year. Approximately how many years will it take for the investment to reach $15,000? So this one, it, uh, for about time, it has a negative relationship again. So if you increase I, this will decrease N. Hi, my name is Kihan. I'm gonna talk about the capital budgeting, respectively the objective measure and their relationship. Objective measure have benchmark for comparison. Net present value and profitability index would be bigger than zero, and internal and modified internal rate of return would be over the weighted average cost of capital, 14%. It is indicated that the Project is profitable and investable, but subjective measures are not. The number of years required to recover a project cost, which is payback period, provides an indication of the project's risk and recovery, and easy to calculate and also be visible as well. However, it ignores the time value of money, so it's not a good measure of profitability. Discounted payback period, which is calculated with TB, would be bigger than PVP and more clear. ARR would be accepted if the required rate of return is matched. ARR is the rate makes PB of outflow equal sigma PV of inflow. In other words, IRR could be stated that the most basic rate of return for determining whether a project should be carried out 
if NPV is greater than zero, IRR would be greater than WACC. Therefore, as WACC increased, NPV would decrease. So that the percentage of the WACC, ARR, and MIRR should be all equal when the NPV becomes zero. The theory of PI is NPV plus Marshall Recosi divided by the Marshall Recosi. So if the NPV is zero, the PI would be only one. Thank you. Um, hi everyone, I'm Joyce, and I'm going to talk about the subjective measures in the capital budgeting. Next, uh, we can start with the relation of PVP and DPVP. PVP stands for the payback periods. Uh, both these measure will calculate the time needed to recover the original investment cost. Um, but for discounted payback period, it will also account for the time value of money. So because of this, PVP is always shorter than DPVP. So refer to the number that we calculate from the data of the, uh, the company. It takes 2.33 years uh, to cover the cost of the investment, while the DPVP states that it takes 3.43 years. And so it proved that BPP, PVP is always shorter than DPVP. Um, it's the ARR and IRR. ARR stands for the accounting rate of return, while RRR stands for the required rate of return. Um, for ARR, it shows a clear picture of the profitability of a project, and it's easy to calculate and simple to understand. And from our calculation, it's that is 8%. So for the required rate of return RRR, it's really among the investor depending on their tolerance of risk. And it includes several factors such as amount of risk, the inflation, and et cetera. So um, if ARR is larger than RRR, investment would be accepted. But if ARR is equal to RRR or less than RRR, the business will be reject the investment or take further consideration. Um, in the real world, ARR is an unpopular measure because it doesn't consider the exter external factor which affect the profitability and feasibility of the project. Thank you.